A little bit more biography now with apologies to those of you to whom these basic facts are familiar. Scully spent almost all of his academic career at Yale, retiring as Sterling Professor of the History of Art in 1991 and continuing to teach as an emeritus professor until 2009 when he was 89. While he also had a flourishing late career as an adjunct professor at the University of Miami, where for a decade he spent half of each year after stepping down from the Sterling chair at Yale, it is worth saying one more time that New Haven remained his home, his touchstone, as well as the place he looked to for lessons about urbanism almost to the end of his life. And as by now, <clears throat> I suspect everyone here knows, he spent his last six years in Lynchburg, Virginia, the family home of his wife, Catherine Lynn, which is where he died on November 30th, 2017. Other than sabbaticals in Europe and the time he spent abroad as a Marine in World War II, his years in Lynchburg were the only time he did not reside in New Haven. If New Haven is not just a place in which Scully formed so many of his perceptions, but also a frame in which so much of his life played out, another theme of his life and work surely is a sense of constant engagement with the world. As I've said, as an art historian, he refused to accept a purely form-driven way of analyzing art and architecture. He saw everything within the context of its time and its place, and he was the model of the activist scholar. I'll come back to that in a moment, since it brings together his New Haven roots and his academic instincts as perfectly as we could ask for. But first, just a couple more words about his more conventional academic progression, if we could call it that. Scully's student, Neil Levine, the Emmett Blakeney Gleason professor at Harvard has suggested that Scully's interest in seeking an empathetic connection to form <coughs> reflects the influence of Henri Faucillon, who taught at Yale from 1940 till his death in 1943. Levine has written that Faucillon's La Vie des Formes through, and I quote, its emphasis on the changing meanings of forms over time and their relationship to the viewers direct visual experience would remain a guiding principle of Scully's mature thought. His early years as a graduate student at Yale, where he returned in 1946 after being in the Marines, exposed him to colleagues like George Kubler and Carol Meeks. And also Levine has written to the writings of Siegfried Gideon, Henry Russell Hitchcock, D.H. Lawrence, Le Corbusier, and Frank Lloyd Wright. He received his PhD <coughs> in 1949, completing his work in only three and a half years and writing a dissertation that would eventually become one of his most influential books, The Shingle Style, published in 1955. A remarkable work that more or less single-handedly transformed perceptions of late 19th century domestic architecture in the United States rendering what had been thought of as being a vernacular only marginally meaningful to architectural history into a body of work of deep and lasting significance. In 1947, while still a student, Scully would make a brief foray into architectural design himself, taking a course in the architecture department and eventually designing a small suburban house for himself and his first wife, Nancy Keith, who he married in 1942. The design followed a pilgrimage the Scullys took to meet Frank Lloyd Wright, who was his first architectural hero at Taliesin, where with a glorious sense of hubris, or perhaps innocence, they asked the great man to take on the commission himself. Wright actually did produce a house for the Scullys, it did not meet their budget of $20,000. <laughs> and so Scully decided to design a simplified version of it himself, which Neil Levine would later describe 
as a woodsy, part Johnson, part Breuer, international style box. He published his first article, Architecture as a Science, is the scientific method applicable to architectural design in the Yale Scientific Magazine in May of 1948, a critique of Siegfried Gideon that might be said to prefigure Scully's later prominence as a critic of modernist orthodoxy, at least so far as it was expressed in the neo-Bauhaus world of Harvard. By the time that article had appeared, Scully had already burnished his voice in opposition to what might be called Harvard modernism, despite the resemblance of his own house to Harvard modernism, <laughs> by appearing along with Marcel Breuer, Walter Gropius, Philip Johnson, Eero Saarinen, Alfred Barr, Lewis Mumford, and Hitchcock at a symposium at the Museum of Modern Art entitled, What is Happening to Modern Architecture? At which he took issue with Breuer and Gropius for marginalizing right. He was the youngest participant on the panel, and the event would foreshadow a lifelong eagerness to assure that the walls of the academy did not limit his ability to engage in public discourse about architecture. And so his public career was launched. 